Everybody, as you probably know, Bill Vensel here. There we go. Get the live chat going. Let me know if you can hear me. Let me know if you can see me. Drop a comment in the chat. Chat sounds great when used judiciously like this. Thanks, Chuck. So, greetings, everybody. <clears throat> It has been a long time since I have live streamed here on YouTube. And I thought that it would probably, I thought, man, it, you know, it's time to do it again. It's time to live stream again. And I kind of want to get back into it. So I'm not making any promises about frequency or anything, you know, ridiculous like that. But, but I do want to spend some time with you all today talk about a couple things. One is, let me make sure my guitar is actually still in tune. I'm banging it against my studio desk here. Oh, there we go. Um, so I want to do a little bit of a Q&A if you all have any questions or topics you want to discuss around ambient guitar and all that good stuff. Love to do that with you all, just have a conversation. I also wanted to talk about the topic of modulation and chorusing, and you probably noted my slightly controversial title of why, you know, I don't really like to use chorus pedals. And actually, that's true to a certain extent. I, I do have chorus pedals, but I don't often use them, and I actually use some other techniques for getting modulation going in my tone. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit today. And I'm looking over here at the side where I've got my laptop just so I can keep an eye on the chat here. Um, so yeah, hi Chuck and Char and Jared and Hubert. Greetings all. Um, so let's see. I look Let's go with a question or two here first. Um, Jared asks, have you seen the new Firefly baritone with a 30-inch scale? Lynx, that's $170. No, I have not. So Jared says, I just got looks, I just got one and it looks awesome for the price. Well, that's great, Jared. Good to hear. Um, unfortunately, they sent me a white. Oh, yeah, white instead of sunburst. Yeah, that would be sunburst would be my preference too, for sure. Um, for sure. All right, so let's get into the topic a little bit of modulation. I will keep an eye on the chat over here where my finger is pointing. Um, and uh, when I see questions or comments, I'll try to stop and, uh, and answer them. Hey, Jeremy. Hello, Bill from Missouri. Hello, Jeremy from Virginia. All right. So anyhow, here is my tone that I want to kind of break down and discuss a little bit. As you can hear, I've got a volume pedal. It's on the floor. I've got a little pedal board set up with just a compressor. It's a Strymon compressor into, I've got a, just a little bit of overdrive going here, not much, but you can hear probably just a little bit of grit. And then I'm using the Strymon Iridium for the amp modeling uh, tone, okay? From there, I've got this thing, oh, and I've got my, um, my volume pedal too. From there, I'm plugging that pedal board directly into my computer interface. And the reason why I want to do that is I can show you a little bit easier some of the settings that I like and some of the settings that I use from time to time. So a little history on me and modulation or chorus. Way, way, way back in the day when I played in my old prog rock band, um, I had a very small pedal board. This is back in the 
late 70s through the early 90s, had a very small pedal board that just had a uh, distortion, a graphic equalizer, a chorus pedal, and a delay pedal, and a volume pedal. That wasn't the right order there that I just said, but that's basically what it comprised of. And I plugged that pedal board into the front end of a late 70s Fender Deluxe Reverb, and I really enjoyed the sound of that a lot. Um, but after, you know, after the band thing was over, um, and I kind of begun transitioning into more digital recording and digital gear, and in particular, when I started getting interested in a stereo signal path, the idea of using a chorus pedal wasn't, it didn't work as well. In particular, when I had several different uh, delay pedals hooked up, right, to create this more uh, complex type of sound. So I kind of laid off the chorus pedal for a long time, and then in probably delay lines and I won't go through the whole thing but you can turn them on and off here with these little buttons and you can and these knobs here can be used to uh, configure each one of the eight delay lines and the reason why I got this was because I heard about it on the original Alan Holdsworth user forum and um, and it was you know it was noted that he had, helped develop this, and in fact had a lot of Alan Holdsworth presets on this pedal. So I got the pedal, let me put it down here, and started working with it, and it really helped me make a transition into a stereo signal path. So that's item number one, and I'm, I want to talk about a little bit more about those presets and what I learned, but I want to look at the chat here real quick to see if there's any comments or questions. Um, okay. All right, I'm seeing it just got choppy and no audio. Hopefully the, um, hopefully you still have audio um, going. Let, let me know, chat and drop a, drop a comment in the chat if you're still, if you're still having issues. Anyhow, um, it really, using that UD stomp with the Allen Holds, some of the Allen Holdsworth presets or my slightly modified version of those presets really um, kind of became part of my sound for a while. And, um, okay, it's fine now. Great. Good to hear. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, since then, uh, I've been on the hunt for a a pedal or a plug-in that can recreate those UD Stomp Allen Holdsworth presets. And it took me a long time to find one, and I'm gonna show you the one I found. I've talked about it a couple times here on the channel. But because of the standard chorus sound, um, when I put my typical pedal board together, even with you know the typical types of delays that I use, whether it's, a, say, a Strymon delay or TC Electronic, a flashback triple delay, which I still own and love. Um, I don't often use chorusing because those delays all have the capability of modulating. And this was one of the key things I learned from reading about Alan Holdsworth is that he did not prefer a dedicated chorus pedal either, at least for part of his career, but rather chose to build up a chorus or modulated sound through the use of multiple delays. So that's that's what we're going to talk about today, he said, repeating himself. Um, okay, Chris Davies asks, have I tried the Strymon Cloudburst? Yes, I have, and I do have it. Uh, oh yeah, there it is. It's on the desk here. So there it is, and I've done a demo and a, uh, a performance video 
uh, of this pedal. So, Chris, if you do a little searching on my channel, you'll find them. That's pretty recent within the last week or two. Um, the Cloudburst is a really nice, small, form factor uh, reverb pedal. So uh, you, you can watch my, my review of it or my demo, not really review, a demo of it. So I won't talk about it more other than I really do like it. It's great. Um, okay, uh, so let me go ahead and turn on a uh, picture of the plugin and let's start playing around with it. So the plugin is called the Chow DSP or Chow Matrix. Again, I've talked about this a few times on the channel, but I've not really talked about it on a live stream where we can kind of take our time a little bit and break it down. So let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger on the screen. So you don't need to see my face. There we go. So hopefully it's big enough to see. Um, as you can see with a Chow Matrix, you have the capability just like the old UD stomp pedal of creating multiple delay lines. And as you can see on the screen, I've got eight delay lines set up. And just like the UD stomp, the Chow Matrix can connect delay lines in parallel or in series. So in other words, I can go from my guitar output direct into multiple delay lines that run independently, or I can go into delay lines that will then feed into other delay lines in a serial fashion to create very complex delays. So let me, let me break down what I have going on here. These eight delay lines actually replicate one of the Allen Holdsworth presets on the old UD stomp pedal. And that's what you heard when I first started the live stream. Let me go ahead and play a couple of notes here. I love that sound. I, it's To me, it's kind of magical. And it's significantly different from a standard chorus pedal. Um, there is chorusing going on, obviously, right, with the comb filtering that you hear with chorus pedals and things like that. But because it's created out of eight discrete delay lines, it's much more complex. And if you pull back the wet uh, balance with the dry balance, you can create a very um, subtle effect. Um, all right, so let's break it down a little bit. The eight delay lines are in parallel. So the way this thing goes down is the signal comes into the plug-in, my mono guitar signal, and it immediately feeds eight into each of the eight delay lines. And then those eight delay lines combine together into the stereo output of the plug-in. So let's examine each one quickly. So delay line number one, if, if you've got a big enough screen, you'll be able to see that the delay time is set for 23 milliseconds and it's panned all the way to the left. And as you can hear, there's modulation going on. That's, this is one of the great things about the Chow Matrix. Not only can you set your delay up, but you can apply a high and low pass filter. You can do pitch shifting. You can do, do a diffusion uh, setting to make, it, to make the, uh, the delay repeats less distinct. You can add distortion. You can reverse the delay. And you can add modulation, and then you can pan the delay across the stereo field. So I've got this panned all the way left to my left. And it's a very short delay, 23 milliseconds, but it is modulating. So you can hear the pitch wavering. So let's check out delay line number two. I'm going to come back to the chat in a minute, okay? Give me about three or four minutes. Delay line number two is almost the same. It's a little bit longer, 30 milliseconds. And this time it's panned all the way right. Delay line number three is a little bit longer yet at 38 milliseconds, and it's panned all the way to the right also. Delay line number four is 47 milliseconds. It's panned all the way to the left. 
And at this point, you can start to hear just a little bit of a slap. Just a little bit. But all four of these delay lines so far have modulation going. You can hear that little wavering going. Delay line number five, now we're getting into longer delays. This is 300 milliseconds. Okay. It does have some modulation going on also. It's panned left. Delay line number six is 400 milliseconds panned right. I'm sorry, that's pan... Yeah. No, that's panned left also. Sorry, put that wrong. Delay line number seven is 341 milliseconds. Okay, great. Delay line number eight then is 451 milliseconds. And that's panned right, as you can hear. All right, so let's put it all together and I will turn off the plug-in so you can see my face again. There we go. Now let's put it all together and we'll get that we'll get that overall sound. As you can hear when I just kind of hit the hit the strings, you get a very complex combination of delays to the right and to the left and oh by the way, I hope you're wearing headphones or you're listening on speakers or something like that. Even earbuds will work great. I want you to be able to hear that stereo field coming in. All right, so that's the first preset. Let me go to the chat and then I'm going to come back to the plugin and I want to show you a second preset. All right, so. What do we got going on in the chat? Lots of people. That's awesome. Thank you so much for joining the live stream. Um, all right. So Chuck asks, I'm good on the signal path through the end of the board. Any tips on the path from the board into the DAW? Okay. So Chuck, what I would suggest, I don't know what your full pedal board is, obviously. But if your audio interface into your computer has line inputs, okay, I'm assuming that it does, I would take the end of your signal path, assuming that you have some kind of amp modeling in place, take the end of your pedal board and plug it into the line inputs in your computer interface, and then fire up your recording software. I use Logic Pro and then create channels that, or create uh, channels or tracks in your DAW that are set to the line inputs of your audio interface, and then you can record that. Now, if, if you're using a traditional amplifier, you'll probably need to use a microphone on the amplifier and then bring that into the DAW through your audio interface. Hopefully that answers that. If it didn't, just let me know. Okay. Hubert says, chorus is really an effect of the 80s. Well, that's true. However, it's been a persistent effect through the decades. You don't hear as much uh, chorusing, say, like, um, oh, I don't know, like the, like the police, you know, some of the police songs that had heavy chorusing going on. Um, but if you listen carefully to a lot of recorded arrangements, you'll still, still hear a lot of chorusing going on for sure. Um, okay, let's see. The Chow, uh, Jeremy says the Chow Matrix has been the best plug-in uh, you directed me to, Bill. Yes. And it's free. Isn't that amazing? Uh, multiple delays for ambient fun. Thanks for showing how to use this wonderful piece of tech. Well, you're welcome. Um, also, I, I would, I would uh, put a plug-in for the developer of the software you can get to the he's got a patreon page so if you do have a few bucks a few dollars euros whatever your currency is that you can send his way to help support him i would definitely highly encourage that uh, the these plugins are high value high quality plugins and they're definitely worth investing a few you know little some money in to uh, ensure that this this uh, guy can keep 
developing those plugins. All right, Firefly Base 6. I don't know. I've never heard of this. Same. Sounds like uh, several of you have been checking out the Firefly Baritones and Base 6. That's great. I will check that out later this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Alan says, any chance of a few baritone ambient guitar lessons? Maybe I could do a little bit on the on this live stream. Um, give me a couple minutes, though, okay? Um, yeah, Hubert says, Mike Stern used to have chorus on his solos all the time. Bloody awful, in my humble opinion. Yeah, chorus on leads can be not good if it's if there's too much going on and in fact in the 80s there typically was too much going on my phone is going off here so let's speaking of leads let's look at another Alan Holdsworth preset that I've recreated with the chow matrix so let me go ahead and flip to that uh, in the, uh, in the UD Stomp, it's called um, Lead One. It's, if you do happen to have a UD Stomp, <laughs> there might be a couple of you out there. It's uh, patch number 121. And let me go ahead and get a little lead tone dialed up here, and let me play a little bit through this, uh, through this patch. <laughs> Now that, I need to dial back the wet balance a little bit. So let's take the wet down to about negative six. Oh yeah, I... I know, I know, Hubert, you know, I, I don't disagree with the 80s lead thing, but that is, that is a, um, that's a chorus lead sound I can get behind. Let's take a brief look at that one. So uh, back to the uh, Chow Matrix on this one. So uh, if you look across the uh, delay lines, it's still eight parallel delay lines. And we're starting, I won't go through each one of them this time because I think you guys get the drift, but we're starting off again, very short 29 second delays. Um, at this point though, Actually, there's no modulation set up for any of the eight delays. So this is this is straight delay. But because of the difference in delay times, you're, we're still getting a little bit of comb filtering that is a little bit like a chorus. Okay, so anyhow, we're going from 29.7 milliseconds up to 461 milliseconds. That's delay line one to delay line eight. Everything's kind of panned to the right and to the left to create this really cool uh, stereo image. And yeah, it's just... One of the things I like about it, too, is it creates a very mid-range focused sound. I don't know if you can hear that. I 
love that sound. I know, I know it's not a sound for everybody, but I personally really love that. I resonate with that, even though I can't play at all like Alan Holsworth. And even though his lead tone is not quite that on his albums or live, it's much more subtle. But um, if you dial that, if I dial that way back, you'd have, we'd have more of a feel for what the Holsworth sound was. Anyhow, that, so that's preset number two. Let me go back over here. Um, all right. This, this solo tone reminds me of Peter Gabriel. Oh, really? Huh. I've never thought about that before. Well, that's cool. All right. So anyhow, I want to show you one other patch on the UD stomp here, or not the UD stomp, the Chow Matrix. Okay, so there we go. Back to my clean tone. Um, let me go ahead and flip to another user preset. This is called, um, yeah, da, 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 I got a few of them here. Okay, yeah, this is called Swell Effects 1. And this is an interesting one. This is designed for volume swells. If you're familiar with some of the uh, Alan Holdsworth catalog, you'll know that he played uh, some very complex chord progressions with volume swells. And that's kind of what this patch is meant to do to, uh, I'm sorry, meant to facilitate on the UD stomp. So this is what it sounds like. that a lot. So uh, let's take a look at that one. So Marcus, hey Marcus, how's it going? Uh, I know a very awesome volume cell song. It's called Sleep, Sleep, Beauty, Bright. Yeah, Sleep, Sleep, Beauty, Bright. It's the last song on my album, Anodyne. And Marcus, you've mentioned you, you like that song and thank you so much. That's one of my favorite songs in the Chords of Orion um, discography, if you will. I really enjoy that one. It, I, if you go and look for it, though, Sleep, Sleep, Beauty, Bright, I will warn you, it's uh, about 31 minutes long or something like that. But it's re I just really, I was, in a, I was in a mood when I played that one. Um, and uh, it means a lot to me. Anyhow, let's take a look at this. Love that sound too. So let's go back to the plugin. Let's just take a look at this one. Again, uh, the eight delay lines are in parallel, and this is something that Alan Holdsworth really kind of focused on, right? Um, he, I'm sure at some point he used delays in series. Well, I have to believe he did, but these UD Stomp presets are all delay lines in parallel so that the delays can uh, sound out independently, but because they work in a stereo field, they also intermingle in terms of phase cancellation and modulation. On this particular preset, it's important to note that on the UD stomp, the dry level is set to zero. It's turned off. Um, I've got the dry level 24 decibels down on this patch just because I wanted just just a little bit of dry that rides underneath all the delays. But again, we've got uh, delays from 21 milliseconds up to 400 milliseconds, and everything is panned left and right evenly. And there is 
modulation on each of the delay lines. Um, and again. Now, one thing I like to do in conjunction with this preset is add a regular, I'll call it a regular delay. And in this case, I'm going to use the Valhalla Delay plugin, and I'm going to place it after the Chow Matrix. So um, let me bring that in and see if I can actually bring that on screen for you. Hang on a sec here. Uh, I think that, yep, that's it. Okay, let me turn the Valhalla delay on and just show you that real quick. There we go. So at, before I play it, I'll just tell you what it is. I'm using the tape style delay of the Valhalla delay. So you could do this with, the, uh, with one of the stock delays in your recording software. For example, I'm, again, I'm using Logic Pro. There is a tape delay plugin that can get pretty close to what this setup is. Anyhow, um, it's a tape delay. Uh, there's a little bit of offset to give a little bit of stereo field. That's that spread knob on the delay. And it's a, I've got it set up to be in sync with the tempo. The tempo currently is 120 beats per minute. I've got it set up for a whole note uh, delay. And then as you can see, 55% feedback, stereo width all the way up. And I've got a little bit of the tape kind of character knobs, color, diffusion, mod, age, size, flutter. I've got a little bit of that going. I'm also cutting off a little bit of the highs with the high EQ set down to 10 kilohertz instead of all the way up. Okay, so that's the delay. And again, it's after the Chow Matrix. So you have the Chow Matrix running into the Valhalla delay. And here's what that sounds like. that a lot. Uh, let's see. Hubert asks, uh, what would a fast run sound like with this setup? And Hubert, I assume you mean this one? Yeah. Also, if we go for a lead tone... Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just clipped everything. Sorry, that probably sounded really bad. So I won't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, it's not really designed. There's so much going on. It's more designed for... It's more designed for uh, slow, slower volume swell type of work. Uh, let's see. And Jeremy says another great product, Valhalla DSP is the is the bee's knees. Hey, you must not be a teenager. Uh, best 50 bucks I ever spent. Yes. Yeah. It's definitely worth a $50 if you're looking for a software based delay plugin for sure. All 
All right, Marcus says, Bill, how do you handle the fact that if you have more effects, you cannot put them to use all? Oh, okay, always feel guilty because I have the Volante and the Timeline, but also for Night Sky because I'm not using the, uh, oh, and not using the Big Sky algorithm. So, so Marcus, it sounds like you, how do I handle the fact that if I have all these pedals and I don't use them all, I... Uh, if I'm understanding you right, so let me know if I'm not, but what I would say is that when we as guitarists, ambient guitarists or otherwise, when we buy pedals, I think it's a good idea to have an idea of how you're going to use or leverage the pedal. Um, so, um, huh, all right. Uh, so anyhow, to see, you know, to see how you would use that pedal or to understand how you would use the pedal. That way, when you put the pedal board together, you'll kind of know what your purpose is going to be for each of the pedals on your board. And I, th- I think that's really important. Um, now, I've got a ton of pedals, okay? I'm a YouTuber, right? And you guys know the drill on all that stuff. I do buy a lot of equipment manufacturers send me stuff. It, it, that's the way it is, right? So I've got way more than I could ever use on a single pedal board. But when I, f- when I do build a pedal board, I find myself going for fairly simple pedal boards that accomplish a specific purpose. And again, I'm not playing out live. I'm here in my basement studio and I'm recording or shooting YouTube videos. So I do have the luxury of being able to take a pedal board apart and then rebuild it. So if you're a live musician, it's a little bit different, right? You've got to kind of figure out, okay, what am I going to be doing live with my gig, whether it's a solo, duo, band, whatever it might be, and what do I need and how do I arrange it? And I would definitely recommend only using the pedals that you're going to get a lot of value out of on a pedal board. So... That was long-winded, and hopefully it answered your question, or at least began to address your question. Um, yeah, Dried Music says, Really? I actually like chorus pedals with a compression at the same time. Sounds great on so many songs uh, written with it. Minimally used, it truly stands out. Oh, I don't, I don't disagree with you at all. There are so many classic songs out there that make great use of chorus pedals. I'm only speaking for me personally in my experience, right? The music, playing music, uh, putting, putting together gear that works for you is such a personal decision. And what sounds good to me or what sounds good when, you know, Hopefully, at, on some level, what I play sounds good to somebody, right? What That sound that might be pl- pleasant when I play it, if somebody else is using the same equipment, they may not get the same results. Or if I'm playing your pedal board, I may not be able to get the same kind of tones that you get out of it because we're all thinking differently, right? We all have different approaches to the instrument, the touch, the feel, the phrasing. There's so many variables that... Uh, that go into creating a guitar tone. Yeah, that's my sermon for the day. All right. Um, Let's see. Jeremy says, I'm all software, by the way, Bill. Me and pedal boards have been divorced for a few years. Uh, Diabetic neuropathy have my feet held hostage. Ooh, yeah. So what a wonderful thing it is that we have so many options now in software to be able to get really cool guitar tones. 20 years ago, that was not the case. There were a few, but it's pretty limited. Now the world is our oyster. So the software world is our oyster, so to speak. What kind of music, uh, Siggy says, what kind of music would you make if you weren't doing ambient stuff? I think for me right now, uh, that would be some kind of acoustic guitar. Uh, So again, if you take all the pedals and stuff away, it would just be plain acoustic guitar. Uh, finger style, probably somewhere off in a Celtic kind of direction uh, with alternate tunings and things like that. I do that. I, I do that a lot when I sit around and play around the house and practice. I really, really enjoy that a lot. Um, 
Okay. Um, have I ever played a Digitex space station? I have not. Um, they're, they're older units, right? And they're no longer in production. They've gotten more expensive lately, as some vintage gear does, right? So that, that UD stomp, I don't know what they're going for now, but I think I paid 250 for it. I got it on sale. It was like a B stock on or return on sale from musician's friend or someplace like that. And it was a really good deal. And then several years later, I noticed they were going for almost $1,000 on eBay all right, because they were no longer being made. I don't know what they're going for now, but they're pretty old, 16-bit. Um, you know, I think they are. They're cool, but they're getting a little long in the tooth. Um, let's see. Uh, Arthur asks, are you already finding your way around the fractal FM nine? Yeah, I, I, I think I only did that one video maybe, or two videos with the FM nine. It's sitting behind me on the floor here and I keep looking at it thinking I got to get back into this and build some patches. What I would like to do with that is build some of my kind of what I would call my standard chords of Orion patches and then do a video or two where I kind of break them down uh, for whoever might be interested. But uh, I do like the FM9 a lot. Um, the amp modeling is really good um, with the fractal equipment. I really like the, uh, it's a little bit daunting but I really like all of the options um, in the amp modeling section. It's even more options than in the Helix uh, line, right, uh, when you set up your amp model. And in, as a matter of fact, the FM9, like every effect, has a million options. So, yeah, it definitely takes a little while to sort through. But uh, I did, you know, I did find a couple of sounds that I really, really like, so I'm kind of I'm wanting to tweak them more and kind of fine tune them. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, now we're now, now we're talking Celtic music a little bit. John Martin's my favorite. He played in CGC FGC a lot. Yeah, uh, I like John Martin too. He's got some good stuff. Uh, my favorite uh, Celtic style guitarist is Martin Simpson. I really, really enjoy uh, his music. Um, I heard him long, long ago. I was in the family minivan. My wife had gone into the grocery store. I had four little kids in the back who were making a yuck, you know, raising a ruckus. And I was listening. It was a Sunday evening. I was listening to Prairie Home Companion. If you remember, if you're in the U.S., you might remember that radio show. And um, Martin Simpson came on and played this haunting uh, piece, and I didn't know who it was. It took me a couple years to figure out it was him. And so, yeah, it was really cool. But uh, yeah, I like Martin Simpson, but John Martin's really, he's no slouch either, he's great. Um, Saxon Moon, Tribal and Bombastic. I'm not familiar with Saxon Moon. I will, I will check that out. Oh man, Alan. You got another alternate tuning. You guys need to check the chat out. Alan's got some good suggestions for alternate tunings. A G A E G C. Um, so, when we talk about baritone guitars, getting back to that, for whoever asked about some baritone tips, I generally tune my baritones to what I call baritone B standard or baritone standard. So it's B E A D F sharp and B. It's basically a perfect fourth below standard tuning um, for a uh, standard guitar. But, you know, if you take that B string down to, you know, one, you know, one whole step, you're down to A. And you can create a the baritone version of Dadged very easily, where instead of the lowest string being a D, the low string is an A. You can easily on this guitar, I can easily even bring that low B down to a low G, and then you're kind of in that drop G kind of thing if you if you enjoy the drop tunings. 
Uh, so you, there's, a, there's some really interesting things you can do. But as far as a couple of tips for baritones, let me just mention a couple. Um, I'm going to go back to that chorus real quick. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, oh, I'm going to turn off the, the Valhalla delay. There we go. All right, so just a couple of quick baritone tips. Um, one thing I would suggest is that you try not to think about it in the same way that you do as a standard guitar. Um, you can do that, but I think it's useful to think about it as a different instrument. So, for example, you know, I can play a first position um, what would be an E major, it's going to be a B major in baritone. And I can play that first position, what would be an A in standard, but it's an E major in baritone tuning. And, you know, they don't sound bad, but what I have found that I really prefer is uh, chords, chord voicings that make use of wider intervals. So what you'll see me do a lot with a baritone is create a chord like this. For example, if I want to play a B minor, instead of playing down here in the first position, I will play up in the seventh position and not play all the strings. There I've got, I've got that low B, that tremendous low B. But I can also add in notes that are much, much higher in pitch in a different octave, right? And at that point then, I find that I get better clarity in the chordal structure itself. In addition, you can, um, it makes it easier to play, you know, kind of melody lines. That's another thing I would recommend also with baritone is incorporate fingers along with a pick, whether you use just straight fingers or if you use a pick and then do what I call hybrid picking where I'm holding the pick and using my three fingers. You can also use a thumb pick, and I don't have one handy here, so I can't demonstrate that. But it'll, you can get similar uh, similar pick dynamic as uh, with a thumb pick as you can with the hybrid picking. The other tip I would have for baritone. And this is something that I still struggle with after all these years of playing baritone, is understanding what the chords you're playing are. You know, for, you know, we get so, if you're like me and you've been playing guitar for many, many, many years, you know, my hand goes here and I think E minor. Well, that's not right. That's B minor. And, or my hand goes here and I think, you know, G or G major. Well, that's not right. That's a D. So playing with other instru you know, instruments, it's really important to, under to kind of rethink all the chords and know what they are in baritone land so that, you know, so that if you, you know, you're with your, your buddies who are playing and they say, hey, we're going to do blues in G, you don't do this because you're playing blues in D and that's not going to work, right? So... Uh, that's the other thing I would recommend is take the time to really incorporate into your mind, into your muscle memory, what the chords are in baritone land versus standard guitar land. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, a couple quick tips there. Um, okay, uh, let's see. What do uh, Motosport says? What do you think about the Head Rush MX5 for ambient music? You know, I I think it's great. I have an MX5. I also have the full size pedal board, and I do use them. One of the things that I really like about the Head Rush gear are the amp modeling. Um, I 
I really like their Fender amp model feeding into a their Marshall style cabinet. I think it sounds really good. Their the effects um, with the Headrush gear are a little more simplistic, actually a lot more simplistic than something like a Line Six. But because they have um, effects loops, you can incorporate the um, the full size pedal board or the MX-5 into an, all, an auxiliary pedal board if you need pedals that don't do what the, um, what the head rush will do. So the way I would, if I was gonna use the MX-5 a lot, um, I would probably use it kind of as the brain for a pedal board. So I'd have it kind of like the, um, the Line 6 HX Stomp where a lot of people will use that on a pedal board and then use the effects loop to patch in other pedals with it to create a, you know, a full featured pedal board. I'd probably use the MX-5 in a similar way. I love the fact that it's got the built-in volume expression pedal. It's a little small, but it works really well. And then uh, you can set up basic patches with all standard delays and choruses and phasers and whatnot. And then if you have some specialty pedals that you need, you can patch them into the effects loop. It's pretty cool. As a matter of fact, I would, you know, on that topic with all of these multiple effects units, like your head rushes, your Line 6 family, the Fractal, the Boss GT1000, even the more um, GE 300, 200, um, if there's an effects loop in the multi-effects unit, it's, you've got a lot of options. You can build patches around your multi-effects unit and then use your effects loop to bring in additional effects that the multi-effects unit may not do as well or may not do at all. So kind of cool. I, I like that a lot, actually. Um, Okay, would I be, uh, Pedro asks, would I be interested in making soundtracks? Well, funny you should mention that last year I did a licensing agreement with, it's not quite a soundtrack, but it kind of is. I did a licensing agreement with a company called Hatch, and they make a uh, really fancy alarm clock, if you will. It's called the Hatch Restore. And um, it has, there's some theories about, you know, light, soft light coming on a half an hour before you wake up. And so that's got that. But it also has the ability to play playlists or soundtracks um, to help you fall asleep and to help you wake up. And so they reached out. And so I did a licensing agreement with some of the music on my Chords of Orion long play channel, which is where I do more soundtracky kinds of things. And uh, so, yeah, so it's I've got some sleep soundtracks going as far as movies or uh, whatnot like that. That would be fun. I think that might be a little bit later in my life when I'm not working full, you know, I still have a full-time job, full-time gig as an IT consultant, so my time's a little limited. I think I'd feel pretty daunted by the prospect of doing a soundtrack. And that would be kind of scary. For one thing, I've never done a full soundtrack, but for another thing, it would be the time. Um, Marcus says Alan's tuning, Alan Holdsworth's tunings are too much for my brain to handle. Absolutely. They're awesome, though. If, and if you're not familiar with Alan Holdsworth, I highly recommend um, getting some exposure to his music. It'll blow your mind for sure. There aren't many baritone guitars on the market. Any suggestions? Um, yes. So uh, one suggestion would be the current PRS baritone that is available. Um, it is not, it's not like this one. This is a semi-hollow um, guitar, uh, but there's a solid body version of this guitar, uh, that you can buy. I've seen it on Sweetwater and, um, it's a little more expensive than when I bought this one. This was, I purchased this one back in 2016, 2017. So, you know, it's a little inflation, right? But it's a little more expensive, but it, these are great guitars. Definitely recommend them. Let me grab another, uh, baritone here that I would definitely recommend. 
Uh, whoa. There we go. I'm creating a disaster in the studio. Um, I would definitely recommend, this is not a cheap guitar, but I would definitely recommend the D'Angelico baritones that are currently available. Sorry about that. So the D'Angelico baritones that are currently available. This is the um, Atlantic. There is a semi-hollow version called the SS. These are fabulous. I mean, they really are. They're not cheap, though, so it depends on your budget. All right. Um, there are other baritone options out there, too, but I guess one of the things I would say about baritones, I've said this before in some other videos, is if you are interested in baritones and you find a baritone that is interesting to you that you want to try out, don't delay uh, to buy one because baritones are special, they're specialty instruments, and most guitar builders don't make baritone models for very long. Uh, like, you're not going to find uh, a baritone that's been around, um, except for maybe the Dan Electro Longhorn. That's been around for a long time. But outside of that, you're not going to find many baritone models that have been around for decades. They typically come and go on a, you know, a cycle of however many years, four, five, six years. So if you're interested in one, make sure you pick it up um, and, and get it so you're not disappointed that, you know, by the time you think, oh, now I'm ready to get it, oh, they don't make it anymore. You know, it's kind of a bummer, right? I've had that happen to me a couple times. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, Marcus says, I got myself a PRS SE277 soap bar in Sunburst. Yes. So that's this one here, right? That's the, um, it's the semi-hollow. It's got the soap bar, but this is the charcoal, not the Sunburst. I do have a Sunburst version of it too. They're very nice. Very nice for sure. Um, Let's see. John Martin just detuned ordinary guitars, as did Joni Mitchell, Nick Drake, and Neil Young. Absolutely. Don't hesitate to detune regular guitars. Not at all. But I will say that a baritone guitar, even though you might detune a standard guitar to the same pitches, the baritone guitar is going to actually sound different and it's going to feel different because of the longer scale length and the typically thicker strings that you're gonna use. So it does feel different and it, I feel like it makes you wanna, it makes me wanna play in a different fashion, right? I approach the instrument a little bit differently. But yes, by all means, detune standard guitars. Don't be afraid of doing that. Um, if you do go with different strings, make sure you pull up one of the online string tension calculators to make sure that whatever you're tuning to, it, if, if it's an acoustic guitar particularly, to make sure that the overall string tension is going to be safe for the guitar. So pro tip there, make sure you do that. Um, man, we're, we're really getting into tunings, aren't we? That's cool. Uh, so Jeremy says, I like double drop D, drop D, dad gad, open D, and shortcut capos. Yes. The uh, partial, I call them partial capos that only cover two or three of the strings. Definitely like those. You can create, um, I call them faux alternate tunings with uh, partial capos. So that's great. Okay. Um, so anyhow, that those are some ideas for how to think about delay versus chorus, right? So again... I'm heavily influenced by Holdsworth, right? And so I love those types of tones. I realize they're not for everybody, but what I would suggest that you think about as you're putting together your tone is how you can leverage multiple modulating delays to create different types of chorusing sounds that are not the same, right? They're not the same as a standard chorus pedal. You can create more subtlety in some cases. Uh, you can create more stereo width in other cases. And uh, 
you can create more depth in other cases without massive warbling like, you know, uh, really apparent pitch shifting, you know, in the uh, wavering in a standard chorus pedal. Um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I, what I want to do here is I'm going to go back to the volume swell uh, patch. And I'm going to turn that Valhalla delay back on. And I'm just going to play for a couple minutes. And um, hopefully, hopefully you guys are okay with that. And I want to see what happens here with just with some chordal structures. We talked a little bit, or I talked a little bit about baritones. So if you look, try to keep my hands up here so you can kind of see what I'm doing chord-wise. And um, these will be volume swells, so we'll be going fairly slow. Whoops. There we go. Something's wrong here. Let me check my tuning here. Sorry, guys. Okay, let's try that again. So if you looked at what I was doing, I didn't play any full chords. Right? I didn't do anything like that. The chord voicings I used were typically two or three strings, and the intervals were rather wide. Right? So let's turn off the delay so you can hear that better. That's a standard that's standard D, right? Okay, so and I, I just kinda, you know, I'm not thinking, oh, this is the a absolute chord progression because I'm improvising, but what I'm thinking is I wanna keep these intervals wide so that I can create clarity in the chord voicings. You know, there's an interval of a ninth there, right? So that's what goes through my head when I'm playing these types of chord voicings. And 
thinking about, you know, okay, how do I want to res- resolve? How do I want to resolve that? Hmm. Yeah. So I couldn't even tell you what I was going to play before I played it. Again, I'm just improvising. Um, but again, with the baritone, what I really like is you can take advantage of the lower register to create the really um, wide chord, chord voicings. I like that a lot. Okay. Anyhow, let me check this here. Uh, okay. Love your stomp into Big Sky videos, Bill. Oh, thank you. Um and I love those long decays, Natasha says. Yes, I do too. Um, and we could, I wasn't going to devolve into this too much, but we could do a little Frippertronics thing here if I bring up the dry a little bit and I increased the Valhalla delay time quite a bit. Let's see what we get. Uh, Let me turn on the delay. I forgot to do that. So let's try it again. Ah, yes. So the combination of the, the Alan Holdsworth presets on the Chow Matrix with a simple Valhalla delay setting, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I like that a lot. Let's see what else we got going on here. Open D tuning. Try tone lower and put the capo on. Yes. Okay. Fripp's, oh, okay. So now we're talking about Fripp's new standard tuning. Uh, which is an interesting tuning. It's based uh, low. The low, the sixth string is G or C. Sorry, C. The high string is a G, and it's it's tuned in fifths, so it's perfect fifth all the way up, kind of like a cello or a violin. But the difference between the second string and the first string is a minor third. So the second string is an E. Like a like the E on a standard guitar, and then that first string instead of being an E is actually a G. I intensely dislike that. I tried working with a new standard tuning a good bit ago, and I was cool with the perfect fifths. Um, you know, it was like, oh yeah, I can get used to that. But I really disliked the minor third between the first and second string. I don't. I don't know what it was. It just didn't jibe with the kind of phrases and lines that that I like to play or that I can play and make sound halfway decent. Uh, But it's it's a cool tuning. Um, Now, I will I will say that a lot of the classic King Crimson's I saw a uh, a comment about, you know, the something about preferring the Fripp pieces in uh, new standard tuning, I think. 
I will say, though, that a lot of what Robert Fripp did in the earlier King Crimson days, that was all standard tuning um, and uh, kind of interesting. And I think he bops back and forth between standard and new standard. Okay, let's see. Jeremy says, I, u- I do use a USB expression pedal for volume soles. Yeah, that's great. Linear taper. Yeah, we talked. I talked about that earlier this week. Linear versus audio taper. I've got my little alligator on the floor here, so using using my old buddy. Um, and let's see what we got going on here. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So anyhow, um, I think I'm just going to play for a few minutes. If you have any other questions, go ahead and uh, post them in the chat. I'll answer them. But um, after I play for a few minutes, answer a couple more questions. I think I'm going to chill out. I'll shut down the live stream, and I'm going to do some chilling for the rest of this Saturday. But here's a little bit more on the Frippertronic side of things. We'll start on a B this time. Feeling kind of minorish, I guess. do that for a long time and I have Um, hopefully when you guys find sounds and textures you like you just hang out with them for a while it's a really good experience Um, okay so what do we have going on here Um, Mr. Lurden Lurden says ever try seven string I do have one I've got a PRS SVN. I guess it's pronounced seven. Um, I have never bonded with the seven string guitar. That's me. That's my shortcoming. I just, I think I have too many years with six strings to get my brain rewired to incorporate that seventh string. I've thought about selling it a bunch of times, but I, I have not been able to do that um, just because I keep thinking, man, I might be really sorry if I sell it. So I still have it, but um, I don't know how to do anything. Re- I, I have not done anything with it that I've really considered to be really good, uh, at least good for me. Um, anyhow, let's see here. What am I missing? Uh, do I ever play live gigs, either solo or with other players? Natasha asked that. The last time I played live as the, the last and only time I've played live as Chords of Orion was in uh, the September of 2019 
at an electronic music festival in New York, uh, here in the United States. It's called Neem Fest, E N E E M F E S T. It was a lot of fun. I'd never done, I'd never performed as Chords of Orion. Now, in my life, I've done a ton of performing. Uh, I've played in bands for many, many years and whatnot and things like that. So, uh, but at this point, no, I'm not currently doing any live gigs. Um, so I'm not saying I won't in the future, but for right now, um, this is, this is what I can do. So I do it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Jeremy says, Devin Townsend, whole drop C and his voice is epic. Yeah. If you're it, Devin Townsend's got some chops for sure. Um, I don't listen to him too often, but, um, I, I do enjoy his guitar tone for sure. Um, Hey Gene, thank you. Appreciate the, uh, comment. Uh, let's see. Drop A on a seven string, kind of manageable. I think it could be. Um, you know, on my seven string, just the standard tuning, it's a B, so you could easily do drop A. Um, have I tried Chase Bliss CXM 1978 pedal? No, I have not. I don't believe I've ever actually tried a Chase Bliss pedal at all. Um, so I, d I don't know what would or would not be comparable to it because I'm not familiar with that pedal. Um, let's see, JTM says, I just bought a new Morley Mini Volume Plus. Oh, that's great. Um, those are great pedals. I, they, one of the great, excuse me, one of the great things about those pedals is um, they have the same circuitry and the same capabilities as the older full-size uh, Morley pedals, but they're smaller, so they don't take up as much room on a pedal board if you don't have a massively huge pedal board. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm personally still good with the full-size pedals, though. Um, I'm pretty used to using them, and, and I've got a few of them. So, But I do have one of the smaller um, 2020 um, Volume Plus pedals, and it's great. Uh, let's see. What are my, let's see, pa, sorry, I'm going to butcher your name. Pagao uh, says, uh, what are my thoughts about the Fender Bass 6 in comparison to Baritones? Well, um, I do have an Ibanez SRC6, which is like a Fender Bass 6. It's the same scale length, and it's tuned the same way. The, in my view, the difference between a Bass 6 and a Baritone is the, to me, the bass six feels like I, I approach it more like a bass because it is tuned it is tuned one full octave lower than a standard guitar. And, and that is essentially bass tuning. Obviously, with the uh, advent of five string basses, you can go lower right than a low E. But for a standard four string bass, that's the basic tuning. So I think of it as bass. I don't play bass, so I kind of play it more like a guitar, but uh, it to me, it feels like a different animal. The scale length, too, it's 30 inches versus, say, like 27 inches. That makes a big difference, too, um, in how you approach the instrument and chord voicings and things like that. Um, Michael Brooks Infinite Guitar, any thoughts? No, I need to go look up Michael Brooks Infinite Guitar. Is that a guitar sustainer tech kind of technology? Um, I, I, I'm interested in those. I, I've never really played a Sustainiac or anything like that, but because um, I typically focus, my focus has been on the Ebo for sustained melody lines. But certainly, that would be really interesting to try out. Um, Okay. Is there a line of pedals with really quiet stomp buttons? So do you mean, you mean pedals that like this cloudburst here I mentioned a little bit ago? Here's the, 
That's the button. To me, that's I'm not sure how you would get quieter than that. Um, and it doesn't click. And it's quiet. Electronically, it's quiet, too. So I would say, you know, the, the Strymon's buttons are pretty quiet. They're not the only ones, though. I think TC Electronic tends to have pretty quiet buttons also. Um, and I'm sure there are many other manufacturers. But if, that, if, if that's not what you're thinking of, you know, drop drop a comment and let me know. Um, so, okay. Great. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and shut down the live stream. I'm just going to play for a few more minutes, and then I'm going to bid you all adieu. I really thank you for joining the live stream. I hope you're all doing well, and uh, I look forward to uh, kind of seeing you guys, as it were, in the next video. I've got some, obviously, coming up in this uh, coming week. So um, here's some more playing. Let's see. What key do I want to go in? Ah, oh, we'll go in this key. everybody. Hope you all have a great rest of the day, great rest of the weekend, and I'll catch you all, like I said, on those next videos. See ya. Oh, maybe if I can end the stream, I'll see ya.